It's down to the final stretch before the much ballyhooed midterm elections. Will there be a Republican wave crashing the Democrats party in DC? A wipeout? Or something in between? What will be the determining factors in this final week to get their take on the state of the race and our nation? We turn next to Katrina Vanden Heuvel, editor and publisher of The Nation magazine, and Hendrik Hertzberg, senior editor and staff writer for The New Yorker. They're coming up after this. We lost almost 8 million jobs, most of them lost before any of our economic policies were put into place. Now, you would have thought, you would have thought that given the crisis, when we got to Washington, Democrats and Republicans would come together. We'd put politics aside and deal with this once in a generation challenge. I hoped, I expected that we could move beyond the game playing and the partisanship and the bickering that had dominated for Washington so long, roll up our sleeves and get to work. Because although we are proud to be Democrats, we are prouder to be Americans. And all of us have a stake in creating a better future. All right, well, that was the president speaking at uh, University of South Car California this weekend. It said there was a large crowd, people waited for hours to get in, a lot of young people there. But I have to say, from that clip, Rick, was he dreaming? I mean, did he just not know what he was up against? Uh, is this baloney or is this a message that really is hitting home for its authenticity? Well, it may be authentic, but it's not hitting home. Um, and that's the thing about uh, Obama, I guess, that so many on the left have been puzzled about at the beginning. Did he really mean it about all that stuff, about how the Republicans were going to play nice? And uh, I'm beginning to think he did, and he's, what he's doing now is pivoting. Um, not soon enough to win a midterm election, which was beyond help anyway, mm -hmm. I think. No, no chance of, of winning that election. But, um, but changing direction for, for 2012. Is that what you see, Katrina, a sort of changing direction of the White House? I mean, I do think President Obama did believe coming in that one could find a new way in Washington. But after the evidence that is in in these last months, uh, it's not the case. And I think he, he's speaking to a younger generation, which I do think wants to see something beyond the partisanship which has defined our politics. But I think it is too late. Um, I think he has, over the last few weeks, crisscrossed the country with tougher speeches than that, yeah. speaking to revving up a base that... I fear the White House made a mistake in demobilizing because that base could have been a counterweight to the force of p money that we are seeing drench our system. Now I'm hearing a lot of past tense here. Uh, do you think it's hopeless? Do you think the Republicans are going to pick up as many seats as people say in the House? They need, um, well, the New York Times has been saying 44 uh, need to be picked up in the House for the Republicans to be sure of securing a majority. I would have said that if you had taken out this covert, coordinated, conservative right-wing money in the last 10 days, that there was more of a chance to keep the House because the Democrats had a sense that this, uh, not unlike 1994, mm -hmm. that they needed to be on the attack and there has been some uptick. But what we are seeing uh, is a dagger directed at the heart of our democracy with this money. There was a guy quoted in the paper today from Action, American Action Network, one of these right-wing money groups, saying, you know, we've been carpet bombing for the last two months. This is sniper time. This is sniper time. And it's an interesting strategy going for races that hadn't been on the, um, really under the spotlight at all, throwing money in places where the Democrats didn't think they were going to have to fight. And of course, with Harry Reid as locked up as he's been in his own fight, there's a guy who usually raises lots of money for the party as a whole and other candidates can't do it this year. Yeah, <clears throat> and our democracy is becoming more and more Latin American. Uh, with the, this, and this is this is really the the big move was that Supreme Court decision, just opening the floodgates to anonymous corporate money, and you know we've got an 18th century system and a 21st century set of of computers determining exactly where to send that money and exactly at what time and in what place. And it's, uh, it's not an equal contest between about democracy and, and money. It's $150 million from independence. Neither are the parties. Now, in, if it was Latin America, we'd have big money, maybe. We'd, at least we'd have big pressure from unions, um, labor groups. Uh, do they stand I take a chance far more of hope. I take far more hope from Latin America than <laughs> yeah. when we used to call it uh, the banana republics. I think there's great resilience and people energy in Latin America these days. We're looking at a $5 billion election, I think $1 billion in the House. Wait, say that again slowly because it's so powerful. We're looking at a $5 billion election, $1 billion just on the House. 
seats. What we've seen, and Rick is right, the Citizens United decision was the beginning of Democracy Inc. But we've also seen a series of decisions and efforts by the Republican Party to dismantle the post-Watergate network of campaign finance structures. Admittedly weak, but those are being dismantled. What we do now, it's a cliche, but organize people versus organize money. And the Democrats, labor unions, others, clearly the disparities are so brazen. We're never going to outgun on that field. And I think a lot of thinking is going to need to go on to fight what we are seeing only the beginning of, because 2012 and beyond could make this seem like child's play. Let's be clear about what the Republicans are saying. They're saying, and Karl Rove said it this weekend, but he wasn't the only one. George Will said the same thing as, ah, there's always been a lot of money. That last few millions that are spent doesn't make much difference. And the Democrats only started complaining about this um, when they were losing. Take a clip, take a quick look at Karl Rove this weekend. You have the Environment America, Feminist Majority, Humane Society Legislative Front, NARAL, Vote Vote Vets, Human Rights Campaign, Planned Parenthood, League of Conservation Voters, Natural Resources Defense Council, Defenders of Wildlife, and a bunch of others, which are all liberal groups that have been using 501c4s with undisclosed money for years and years and years and years and years, and spending tens and billions of dollars, and it's never been an issue until the President of the United States on the day when we have a bad economic jobs report, when we lose 95,000 jobs in September and the unemployment rate is 9.6 percent, the President of the United States goes out and calls conservatives at the Chamber of Commerce and American Crossroads GPS and says these are threats to democracy because they don't disclose their donors. I don't remember him ever saying that all of these liberal groups were threats to democracy when they spent money exactly the same way we are. Once we copied what liberals did, liberals got upset. Rick, your answer. I mean, it does seem to me that McCain Feingold, a lot of talk about campaign finance preceded this election. Quite right about that. It, cer it certainly did. It's been a gigantic issue for decades, really. In fact, you can go way back to the progressive era, mm -hmm. and it's, been, uh, it's, it's always been uh, on the radar. Um, and there's a huge difference. When you hear the names of those liberal groups that he mentions, you know what they're about. You know what their cause is. Uh, American Crossroads. Yeah. Um, they should call it bloody crossroads. They're cross and they're against taxes for roads, I think, is what it is. Yeah. Um, but the Citizens we... United decision did open a new scale, and the scale of money is different in our politics yeah. today. And most of these groups he's talking about are also champions of the Disclose Act, which the Republicans nixed, nixed in the Congress. And most Democrats, not all, support what needs to be a first step, which is Fair Elections Now Act, which would be a small donor system. Campaign finance reformers are no, no longer saying keep all the money out of politics. It's now trying to create a level playing field so ordinary Americans can compete. The other thing about money, Whitman is likely to not win. That's double. She's likely <laughs> to lose in California. And you're going to hear a lot of people like Karl Rove say, oh, look at the power of money. Look, it didn't get her too far. She just broke all records, 140 plus million. But it's the money afterwards. They're buying the best Congress they can. This is, again, not new, but this money is going to be there to dilute and distort reforms this country needs. We've seen it already. As President Obama, a real reform president, put forward reforms, they were diluted and delayed and distorted by money already in the system. Well, coming back to what pressure there is to fight that, we could see this election, the defeat of the man whose name is on that last mm. surviving piece of campaign finance legislation. I'm talking about Russ Feingold. You wrote this week, Katrina, and just to bring you back quickly, you wrote about conviction politics. There's Feingold, there's Periello in Virginia. Are these guys who are at least talking progressive talk um, able to compete against the money? Does the message come through? I think those two, um, and in general, that politics should have a better fighting chance in this country. But I think at the moment, those two have a better chance, short of money being dumped in, because they do stand for their convictions. And they're speaking to voters in, in real ways. And I think that still matters. That is the trick, to build up those of conviction politics and not allow the money to dilute. Mm. Conviction politics, um, speaking in the right ways, are you behind Barack Obama's decision to go on The Daily Show this week, Rick? Did you know about it? I gather he's going on, and then there's the rally uh, next weekend, which I'm looking forward to, fig to finding out what in God's name uh. that's going to be like. <laughs> it's going to restore sanity, I thought. <laughs> you think it's right, though, to go on The Daily Show, be the first president to go on a supposedly comedic, you know, ostensibly comedic uh, news show that has become the news source for huge majorities of our population. It is. The, the, there, there are kind of two, uh, two counter forces to Fox News um, on, the, on the solid 
New York Times kind of uh, traditional side, there's NPR. And on the other side, there's, there's uh, The Daily Show and Stephen Colbert. I mean, these are hugely important outlets for uh, political expression and for information. Well, you mentioned NPR. Where did you places. stand on the Juan Williams firing? I uh, think there's a conversation to be had in this country about what he spoke about, but I'm opposed to firing. And I also think in a broader sense, the resurrection of the right wing's long running attack on public media is a very dangerous one at this time and in our culture. What worry, I mean, I'm clearly President Obama wants to rev up the younger generation. So much of this campaign will have to be about mobilizing a base. But what worries me most about our media political culture going forward is that you have a situation in which verifiable basic facts no longer seem to matter and what that means for our political debate. What about violence really on the ground? Scary. I mean, I'm very concerned by what we've heard out of Arizona the about what's suppression. happened to Raul Grijalva, yeah. his office. He's we been have attacked a, three we times. We have three people investigating that around the country. And going forward, the numbers on voter registration have dropped quite radically this midterm. And that is also about the targeting and taking out of ACORN with the problems. But voter registration is something to pay attention to as well. Final question. I saw a um, NPR poll, I think it was an NPR poll, at least talked about on NPR this week, about senior voting, which is estimated to be at all-time high levels. But instead of the usual predictions that this will be good for Democrats, they're saying these are angry voters. You're talking about my generation? I know. <laughs> <laughs> angry? <laughs> I, you know, this is I, I, the generation I, I, we say vote for democratic initiatives because they remember them. Uh, they, but th they are per perhaps as hopeless and defensive as so many others. And anybody watching this program should not take it from our, mm -hmm. our, uh, our evaluations of what is probably going to happen as an excuse to sit home and not yeah. vote and not to get out there and, and be citizens. Well, there is a hope that the Democrats will actually realize they're in big trouble and really turn out. Eat, pray, vote, because the rollback, it's not a simple choice election in my view, and I know that's the Democratic Party language, but you're talking about rolling back the social and economic civilizing advances of the 20th century. Because, you know, the Medicare, Social Security, minimum wage, Department of Education, I mean, you're, this is on the block in ways that we haven't fully comprehended. You got the last word, can't beat that. Katrina Vanden Heuvel, Rick Hertzberg, you can get more information at our website, grittv.org and of course with our partners at thenation.com.